I wish my grandchildren would run to hear that. <laughs> As a matter of fact, one of my grandchildren said, coming along, uh, uh, Memorial Days and that sort of thing over the years, and they said, Grandma, you were in the armed forces or in the services. Did you get any medals? <laughs> so I was, they kind of shamed me. They, uh, and I said, where are they? And I said, well, I think they're in a such and such a drawer. So they dug them out and they were all black by this time. And, but anyway, I had uh, not been one to uh, wear medals or get involved in Legion or any of the, any of the memorial things that go on with, from the services. But <clears throat> I was quite surprised one morning in September. Incidentally, Bob has already asked you to, if you have questions as I go along, don't wait for half an hour or something like that to answer the question. Just put your hand up. And I asked my daughter to be here in my ears because uh, if you're standing right in front of me, I probably get your message. But uh, without hearing aids, I am in the living the silent world. Now there's some advantages of that too. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> anyway, she, uh, Mary will take the questions and relay them to me because I'm accustomed to her voice and I, I'll do my best to answer any questions you might have. But as I suggested, you do it at the time. Yes, and one morning in September, I have about nine o'clock in the morning, I was in the kitchen, I live alone, and I, uh, the phone was ringing right beside me, but I'm very far away, I don't even hear the phone. So I answered, and I didn't get the voice right off the bat, and uh, I thought, well, it's not as somebody's selling something at this time of the morning, but they always call at six o'clock at night. <laughs> but anyway, I listened for a while, and then finally, I, uh, I think I'm sure the lady on the other end uh, was wondering, well, who am I got here, you see? And then I said, well, just a moment, let's see if I can adjust the phone. And I did make some adjustments and uh, she came back on again. She introduced herself as June Chambers. <laughs> and, uh, and then it didn't quite register to me, but then she mentioned Bob Evans. Well, of course, then I was home free. <laughs> and she mentioned Newton Robinson. And, uh, and tell, to tell me where Newton Robinson was. <laughs> and I said, well, I know. And I said, do you live in Newton Robinson? And she said, no, no, I live in Bond Head. And uh, she said, it's just so just so the Newton Robinson is. And she went on to tell me where Bond Head was. And, and I said, uh, well, you live in the Noble House. And uh, so that's how our, my introduction uh, at that morning. But I had met Joan once before. At, uh, I guess, probably at a banquet, or uh, not a banquet, but a pork barbecue or something. And just on the spur of the moment, of a bunch of people. She registered with me, but I didn't register with her. <laughs> but in any case, she asked me if I would speak to the uh, Historical Society, Newton Robinson, and I was quite familiar with this because I'd heard my sister talk about it for years. And I'd read some articles. I, I uh, do subscribe to the Bradford Westwood and Murray paper. So I try to keep up there, although I don't see many names that I recognize anymore. Mm -hmm. So anyway, she asked if I would, uh, on the memorial service, it wouldn't be on the, she said on the 11th of, yes, of November, but she said it would be close to it. Well, I'd be the speaker. And I said, well, I was a bit hesitant because I had never spoken about the, the war at all. In fact, Mary and Don, my son and daughter, they, they had uh, never heard the story at all either. Uh, not that I was ashamed of it or anything like that, but it wasn't the thing that I uh, got involved in talking about. But anyway, she asked me if I would be the speaker and I said, well, gosh, I don't know now. It's, 65 years since I was discharged from the Air Force. And I said, uh, I had to give it a little bit of thought, but I, I said, maybe we can make it turn, turn the program into a question and answer sort of thing and involve anyone who is present so that they could ask questions and I would attempt to answer them at that time. So with that in mind, she said, well, that, that sounds okay. 
So anyway, we got back together again, and that's how I happened to be here tonight. But in any case, it was through Bob who, first of all, mentioned to June that, uh, that uh, because I had talked to Bob about uh, his father was a, an old favorite of mine around Bradford. So I'll, what I'll attempt to do now, uh, even after 65 years, you might wonder how the, proce the process of getting in, into any for, uh, service uh, organization and what happens after that. And as it goes, and uh, so I mean, what goes into the training, and I simply went down to an old uh, trunk in the, the basement and I grabbed a hold of all the stuff that was there and brought it out, and some of it uh, was uh, pretty high because it was in the basement over and closed up for 65 years. But anyway, I looked it over and uh, I thought, well, maybe I can make something out of this, you see. And as I, as I went along, I said, you know, I, I, really, I really was pleased that June had asked me because I haven't given a stop to a lot of these things and memory started to flow, flow back. And it really was a wonderful trip down memory lane to dig these things out after all those years. Incidentally, you might have noticed in the weekend paper, I think it was Saturday's paper, that now they say that there's the four or five hundred service people from the war of 1939-45, about four or five hundred dying every week. They haven't caught up to me yet. <laughs> But in any case, they are running short of speakers, and that probably that's how I got to do it. <laughs> but uh, I won't attempt to, I brought a lot of newspapers here that I had just saved right after the war, the war is over and all this sort of thing. So if uh, anybody's interested in this sort of thing after the meeting, you can please come up and just uh, look them over and uh, and uh, see what you, uh, there's some of the stars and the star paper and some of the Bradford papers and so forth. But there's been, a, my memories did go back and I had a lot of very, very happy memories. But unfortunately in war, you have a lot of sad ones too. I lost some very, very close friends and Bob has already mentioned Laurie Melbourne. Laurie and I were in school together and we were very close friends all through the years. After high school, Laurie had gone into the teaching profession and he was teaching in St. Catharines. And I had joined the provincial police and I was in the wrong profession. I knew right from the start of the one, but at least that was in the heart of the depression. And it was a job. And uh, it was a job that paid even more than the, the school teachers were making in those days. So that, that but Lori and I, although he was in St. Catharines and I was in Port Credit, we were in touch with each other every day. But we never talked about anything that had to do with the war whatsoever. But one morning I was in the commissioner's office at Queen's Park. And on the way back to Port Credit, I was driving down University Avenue. And you talk about people being given consideration to a future life or future, something they're going to do. Now, if they're a married person or have a lot of responsibilities, that they should give serious consideration of it. But for me to make up my mind about joining the Air Force, it didn't take me a minute. Because one minute ago I had an absolutely one one second ago I had no intention of joining any armed forces, but I was driving down and I saw the sign "Join the Air Force." Believe me, that is the moment that I decided to join the Air Force. I swung around and swung into the drive parking lot. I said, "Where do I join the Air Force?" And he said, "Get in line." <laughs> <laughs> and I was in uniform at the time. And when I, uh, uh, the course give you a preliminary examination, medical and, and uh, that sort of thing, but I think as long as you were 
standing up and warm, that was all that. <laughs> and as far as the aptitude test was concerned, it was one of these qu quickie sort of things, you know, to see if you can put square plugs in round holes and that sort of thing. But they didn't care if you were there to join the Air Force and they asked you what your trade would be. Uh, I said, I would like to be an air crew. And they said, well, you would put you in for service police. And I said, oh, no, no, I don't want that at all, you see. So anyway, they put down for air crew. And I said, navigator or pilot or navigator. But they didn't care at that moment whether I would ever be able to graduate as either a pilot or a navigator. They had another warm body. And if you couldn't do that, you could wash dishes or pans. <laughs> they needed those jobs as well. But anyway, I went home, that, went on and back to Port Credit, and I sat down and wrote to Lori Melbourne, who in some gathered. That very same day, there must be irony in this, but that very same day, Lori was in Hamilton at a teacher's meeting. And when he joined the Air Force in Hamilton, without giving it any forethought, the same as I did. And he wrote to me and said, I joined the Air Force today and our letters crossed. Now that's how close we were. For, we've been close friends for years and we joined the Air Force in some sanity. My training advanced a little faster than his and I got a start up ahead of him and I was fortunate. Bob gave me credit for 39 trips. It was only 34, but I did a few other uh, line uh, bomb or what do you call them? Uh, uh, ling, uh, mine, mine ling things. I forget now. They were around along De uh, Denmark, along somewhere along there, but they really didn't count. So anyway, that is how I got started in the Air Force, and uh, then I was notified what I would, re would report. And the time that you, from the time I joined the Air Force, or, or the, the time I was yes joined, I went in and signed all the documents, made a will and all the rest of these things that you have to do. And from that time until I got started on Bomber Command and flew my first trip, it was almost two years. So I'll go over these things just one step at a time and uh, kind of um, bring things to light that way. I haven't made any, anything more than, a he than headings as I go along. I did start off after I spoke to June, and I thought, well, I better write something out and read it. So I wrote a couple of pages. And then the next morning, it's like you're writing a letter today and reading it in the morning before you post it. You don't post it. <laughs> So anyway, the same thing with what I had written. I said, I, I can't read that sort of thing. So anyway, I decided I would ad lib it. And that's as you've already noticed, that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm stumbling along here. But anyway, as, as I mentioned, ask questions as I go. So anyway, I went in to register. And the first thing when you register, and I guess the, all the three, the three services at that time, the Army, Navy, and Air Force, were three separate divisions. They're all together now. But in the Air Force, they had a manning pool. And what is a manning pool? Well, it's just what it says. It's a pool of men. They have to have a, a lot of men coming through the, uh, coming through the stream. So that when they, they're sent out into their different, whatever they're going to put into, but they have to have a feet at the bottom end. So they have a, a lot of men there up to 10,000 in a manning pool. Just sitting there, just the same as the old uh, sawmills used to have many years ago, they had to build a dam and build up a pool of water so that they could, they could have water to run the, the sawmill all the year round. And that's exactly what a manning pool was. In the Air Force, had there, I think there were five across Canada. The big one was in Toronto at the exhibition grounds. There was Montreal, Halifax, Winnipeg, and Vancouver, I believe, and I guess the Navy and Army had exactly the same thing. But the first thing you do in, when you go in, you're quarantined for 10 days. You can't get out of the place. And that is that you're getting all your needles and all this sort of thing, and getting you accustomed to 
living with a lot of people. And if you don't think that you want a private life, then don't get into the service. <laughs> because you're all there together. And you don't have a private bathroom. But in any case, that is the sort of thing that you would have to first of all, so that you were there in quarantine, you couldn't get out, couldn't get a leave on a weekend or anything else. But you got all your needles, and some people, you know, they really didn't hurt that much, you know, but you're just nervous, you're, you're, you're tense all the time, and lots of times there would be a long line there, and the, the doctors would be plugging with people with the different needles for everything that you can think that, a, that might be, might, you might get involved in. And you'd hear them, somebody plop, and you'd look around and somebody just go and <laughs> But they just kind of stepped over a little bit, one of the nice guys. So this is an after fact. So when they, after the 10 days, you think, gee, you're a senior in here already, you see? But you're moved out into the general popul population. And my bedroom was what you, if you've been down to the winter fair, is where the cattle are. Oh, yeah. They were, they were piled in, uh, the bunks were just too, too high there. I have one in some place where they're three high. But there were about 10,000 of, 10, of us in that one room. And now you get 10,000 people, or men, young men, uh, there, you have to have something for them to do or you're going to be in trouble. So um, the first thing you do is probably try to teach them to, to march. Well, most of us couldn't even walk, let alone march. <laughs> so anyway, that was one thing they did. Uh, they put you on uh, uh, security duty, standing at a, a, a pillbox there with a with a rifle. I don't know, even it wasn't even loaded, but they made you think that it was important that they had security around that building. On the west side of the uh, the uh, auditorium. The, the Navy were in the horse barns. We were in the bullpen, they used to call us, in the bullpen. So I, for, the, for the, the next two two months that I was there, you were out on parade and uh, doing anything that they had uh, thought that you could, they could put up with. One thing I thought I'd do right off the bat, I wouldn't volunteer for anything. I've already volunteered for the Air Force, but I'm not going to, am I speaking too loud or too any other? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not used to it. But anyway, I thought, well, I'm not going to volunteer for anything, but I'm not going to try to get out of anything, whatever they ask me to do. So I remember very well one in the, in the uh, parade square one day, where mine's up, and then, then the sergeant major called out, so, and everybody that has a certain type of driver's license, well, like a G10 or something like this, but means that you have the qualifications to drive a truck. And there's anybody that's got that qualification on your, on your driver's license. So it's up to a few people put up their hand and they said, well, step over here, I want to step out. So anyway, there was a closed ranks and they went away, you see. A little while later, you come back and these fellows that have dropped out a wheelbarrow and a shovel. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what you got in your volunteer. <laughs> So it was, no, that was really long for about, ten, as I say, about two months there, waiting for, for the next posting. And I was steered then into what they call ITS, Initial Training School. And it were, uh, were, were the university downtown there it is at the present time, uh, my memory. What's the downtown university? You have two. Everybody should know that. <coughs> went to, uh, anyway, they went to the teacher's college. That was the teacher's college at one time. But anyway, the, war, war, the Air Force, that was one group that went in there. And I suppose maybe there were a thousand of us in there in different classes and different levels that were coming in every two weeks. And both navigators and, and, and pilots. That, and then you went through the, the, the link trainer sort of thing. And I don't know that I can t explain on a link trainer, but it's something like a, 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 a box, a, a fuselage of a little wee aircraft or something like this. And you got in there and you were blindfolded and everything else. And they, they had a, well, you, probably the best description is you go into some 
malls where you see the kids on these horses, you know, the halls were going in all directions. And they had had uh, some way to tell whether or not you could fly an airplane or not. And then they steered you off in this way. That course was probably for eight weeks. And then you were destroyed. From there on, if you were on the pilot, you went to a pilot training school. You are a navigator, you went to a, a navigator school. So I went to the navigator school, and the one I went to was at Malton. In that day, Malton was out in the open fields, long before Air Canada was. The only aircraft around at that time were Ansons, usually. And they used, used Anson. And this is the first time after I joined the Air Force, I'd been there for four or five months, the first sight of a, 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 an airplane was at, at Malden. And it was an Anson. Now some of you are familiar with an Anson. It's a small two-engine plane that you see flying around here. And they used it. They had uh, uh, civilian pilots that were paid to just to be taxi drivers, so to speak. And their instruction was to take the student navigators, and he did the navigation as well as, well as he could, which was terrible. He didn't know anything about it at all, but he tried to, try to get winds and drifts and that sort of thing, and give the pilot a, a course. They'd, it would probably be a, a, a two-hour trip, that's about it. And about 2,000 feet, very, you can look out and almost touch the top of the tree sometimes. But they, they were given them, the, the instructor gave the, each student so much to do that he couldn't, nobody could possibly do it. But you know, at the time you think, gee, this is, I have to, have to do all of these things. I have to make so many trips and make so, make so many turns and, and, and find out that new courses and all this sort of thing. And the pilot just, uh, you were off course, you weren't uh, anything else. The pilot had the instructions. He was to take the, the student navigator's instructions until he was completely out of control. And the time was up, he was running out of gas, and he had to get back. Then he just simply took off. He knew the province of Ontario just as well as you know your own backyard. And he'd just fly back to Malton on land. So that, we're at AOS then for another couple of months or so. And I then immediately got a posting overseas. Now, when you go in there, you don't. Uh, the good, the good students in all of these things, whether it happened to be a gunner school or navigator school or or pilot school or whatever, usually there's one or two of the top students that became instructors, and that's the way it should be. But some of them like that too. But anyway. Uh, you had to have the best people teaching the, the ones that were coming along. So anyway, I was posted overseas, and we landed, we uh, were sent to Halifax for, for shipment overseas, and we were at Halifax waiting for, I guess, another boat. I have no idea. They didn't tell us what, we were, what happened. Then, then all of a sudden we were put on a train. And I guess there were probably three or four hundred of us, you see, and we were put on our train. We didn't, they didn't tell us what was going to happen. But off, a couple of days later, we were landed uh, in New York on the Hudson. And there was a, the Aquapenia troop was there, and it had been turned into a troop ship. So the parade was right, the train pulled right up beside the boat. And you simply took, you had, to, there were, you, didn't, you didn't have any bellhops. You were your own bellhop. <laughs> and you grabbed your bags and everything else and you up the gang plant into the end of the troop ship. And uh, I was fortunate. I got a commission uh, on graduation from Walton. And how they handled those commissions, I don't know. I think they, it was the luck of the draw. So anyway, uh, you could see when you got on a, on a troop ship, there's a, quite a difference in how the different people were handled. And it certainly wasn't the best ones that got the commissions either, by the way. There were some of really, I had some wonderful people in that, in those, that navigation course that I don't think I wouldn't have passed myself if they hadn't helped me. 
And that was another thing. You were you get, you get in this far, this far into the service life, and you are a friend of your life of being kind of a, uh, and it's kind of an insult to be even washed out, so to speak, so that you were put into some other trade. But I had fellows there that helped me, and they didn't get a commission, and I did. And but I was on the same troop troop ship going overseas. They were building it down below the water level, and the officers were up here. So, I, I, I'm thinking of one person in, in particular, Norm Crook. He and I started, went into Manning Pool together, and we did together all the way through until we got onto that troop ship. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I'd meet him. And he said, uh, he, he was disappointed that he didn't get a commission. And he should have been. He did eventually get a commission. And, uh, but anyway, that's the side of the point. So anyway, we sailed from New York. And I had never seen salt water until I got out from that boat. And I had visualized the ocean with swells and waves and so forth, uh, maybe as high as this room at all times. But that summer that we went over to, to, to sail to England, it was just as smooth as that floor. The ocean was that hot, it was very hot, it was the summer time. Uh, we set an hundred course every, every 15 minutes or so. It took us uh, about seven days to go across to Scotland. So that was my first view of, of, uh, of uh, the, 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 that side of the ocean. We then got on a train and they shipped us down to Bournemouth. Now, you people know Bournemouth on the south coast of England. It's a gorgeous place. It's the, kind of the Garden of Eden to, of England. But it, again, was a manning pool. Except there was a difference. The manning pool there was all in hotels and in dining rooms and this sort of thing. So we're there and they were holding there waiting for you to be shipped out. And my first time, there were four, four of us that went, all graduated from all together, and we stuck together. And the, the salvation was that we played bridge all day. We didn't know anything about bridge, but we played together all the time. We were playing for a tenth of a cent a point, you know, and paid off once a month or something like that. But we got sent to Sidmouth, which was right on the uh, south coast of England, and it was a battle school. Now, it was, uh, once again, they had to do something with us. So we were shipped there, and we were crawling around in the metals and so forth, in the fence rows. Now, that's something the Air Force never does, <laughs> but they did it there uh, just to use up our time. So we were there, I guess, for a month. Then my next posting, and the first time I saw an aircraft or a, uh, on an aerodrome in England, was at Morton Valence which was quite close to the city of Gloucester, right on the end of, uh, close to the Bristol Channel. And once again, it was an Anson's, Anson aircraft. By the way, all the aircraft that were being manufactured in those days were war for, for war purposes, either for, for, for training uh, air crew uh, uh, pilots, which would be single air aircraft type of engine, Tiger Moths and the Hurricanes and that sort of thing. But the answer was the main uh, one that the navigators used. So once again, we were flying around over the, over England, fairly low, well, maybe up, up as high as 4,000 feet. That's about as high as we got. And uh, it was strictly a navigator's training school there. And I was there for another month or so, I forget now. But then my next trip, my next posting was to Wellsbourne, which was very close to Stratford-on-Avon. And of course, there was a lot of history around there, you know, we got in and, and, and saw where Shakespeare lived, and Anne Hathaway, and, and, and what was her name? Hathaway. Pardon? Hathaway? Hathaway? Well, anyway, her cottage was there and that sort of thing, and there's a bit of history around there when you have time to get into it. The, uh, and into the village of Stratford on Avon. But this was what they call a crewing up station. 
so that they, they brought in uh, 14 navigators and 14 pilots at the same time. And they left them there and they said, there are, it's up to you people to find your own navigator or your own pilot. Well, that, they didn't want the responsibility to say that you fly with he, this man here. So it was up to you. They were there and you finally ended up with 14 pairs, navigator and pilot. They were the first two. And they left you there for about another week or two and you went to the mess and you got to know their background, what the person did and this sort of thing. And how I got together with the pilot that I flew with, a man name of Aldred from Regina. He was a school teacher. Uh, I was in the, the barber shop and it was just kind of like a, a street out here where there'd be a building here for a barber shop and one next door for for uh, maybe the, the medical officer or something like that to see him. So I got a haircut and I come out the door and he was walking along the, the, the pathway and uh, I said to him, good evening. And he turned and he said, good evening. And we had our trench coats on and there was no insignia on our trench coats of what rank we had or what we are or what or anything else. So anyway, uh, we started back. I said, uh, he said, are you going to the, me or the mess? And I said, yes. And he said, well, we'll walk over together. And, and I said, one of us, like I said to the other, what's your trade? And uh, so anyway, I, he said, I'm a pilot. And he said, what's your And I said, a navigator. And he said, hey, you crew, have you got a pilot to fly with yet? Or did you just arrive? And I said, yeah, I just arrived yesterday. So he said, you got somebody to fly with? And I said, no. And he said, well, you'll fly with me? <laughs> and I said, well, I don't know whether you can fly the thing. <laughs> and he, of course, didn't know whether I can navigate it. <laughs> and I had those myself. <laughs> so anyway, uh, yeah, I said, sure. So anyway, there we were, apparently. Fortunately, we were about the same age. In our 27, 28, along there which was old for the uh, air crew. So anyway, we walked back and we all, we went to the best and we, put, uh, we knew what our background was and uh, all our brothers and sisters and everything else after two or three days. <laughs> then they brought in the next group was the gunners. There were two gunners in every, every crew. So they brought in then probably 28 gunners, you see, because there were 14 crews. There were 14 pilots and navigators there, you see. And we met, sat in a, room, a building very similar to what we're sitting in here right now. And uh, Ollie and I were sitting over here, you know, and the navigator, all the other, the, 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 the gunners were sitting over here, and it was up to us to pick two gunners, you see, and every, the other crews were doing the same thing. There were, the briefing officer was there and giving him a sales pitch and it went put on, on for probably half an hour. And at the time, you know, we were gawking around, you know, and just trying to figure out who these kids were, even if they did look like kids. <laughs> and they were, some of them were so young. But anyway, I scribbled it out. I said, the kid the second from the back, and the row, second row of them, the back from the second row of the row, wall. And I only look back at these you know, This kid had a, he had a rosy, intelligent look, you see, and I said, well, he, he must be good. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we sat there, and we knew that we had to get him, get him fast. So anyway, as soon as he said, okay, it's up to you fellas now to break up your crews. So I jumped up and I ran across here, back to the raft, I said, are you, are you anybody's crew? And he said, no. I said, will you fly with us? He said, sure. I said, what's your name? He says, Hugh Robinson. I said, where are you from? He said, Fenland Falls. Oh, wow. Well, by golly, this kid was the best thing that we ever did. <laughs> talking, about, uh, talking about gunners, he ended up as our tail gunner. And believe me, we had that gem. He was 19 years old just come up to high school. 
And we didn't care so much about the mid-upper gunner, you see, but we wanted the, 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 the tail gunner. But he turned out to be the one, the, uh, a Cracker Jack. We did then get uh, our mid-upper gunner, was one who did actually get chained and posted from a training school to a, a operational. His name was Robert uh, McLeod, and he was from Winnipeg. But he was about 34 or 35 years old. But he wanted, he'd been uh, in, in from day one, and he had been a, a gunner and instructor in Winnipeg. And uh, so anyway, we got uh, we got Mac, and he came in too. But it just shows that here was a, a young kid of 19, and one we had at uh, 34 or 35 years old, and Mac shouldn't have been there. But anyway, he was upper, our upper gun. A question here. What makes a good tail gunner? Yeah. What makes a good tail gunner? I'm sorry? What makes a good tail gunner? Well, yeah. I guess his ability to handle guns would just be a natural. I, I can't, uh, I can't give, really give you a true answer to your question. But there are good ones and, and, and some of them not so good. But I would think that if you were sitting back there all by yourself with a tail gunner and your turret will rotate, you see, and you have to be able to give instructions if you were under attack. And that's exactly what Robbie could do. And just a, without any, you, know, you wouldn't think that there was a, a, a fighter pilot or a fighter uh, uh, behind you uh, trying to shoot you down. <coughs> Now it didn't happen often. That didn't happen. You know, it didn't happen every time. Only maybe sometimes it never, never. Uh, some aircraft were never attacked. I mean, we were, uh, I think, twice, but three times, I guess. Yeah, I think so. My my log book here is here, and uh, it would. Uh... Yeah. And uh, later on, you're interested in looking at this. Uh, this is a logbook of uh, everything that uh, you were er, in the uh, every time you're in the air. Uh, red is indicates the night trip, and blue would be a, a day trip. But uh, so I think there are three times here that we uh, had been attacked by a fighter, and uh, but I think it was just his cool manner and every. He was so friendly with everybody. He knew all the girls in the kitchen. <laughs> and that's not a bad thing either. <laughs> Especially in the kitchen. <laughs> but anyway, he, I was almost on a, a first name basis with the commanding officer. If you know what I can say, he was a kid from he, he didn't care about anybody else. He said, well, I'm here to do it. And he was friendly, he, he went to a store. And he'd make friends with the, the, the cart while she was making a bill or something, that sort of thing, you see. On, on the perimeter, we'd go out and have tra and crap, uh, crap shooting on the, on, the, <laughs> on the perimeter track, the crew, the, the crew you see. And we'd uh, have a couple of shillings on this thing, you see, have 15 shots. He'd spot us five mm -hmm. and turn his back mm -hmm. and wait till they heard the crack of the, of the, of the trap. And he'd turn and he'd fire and he'd never miss. <laughs> but this is just a natural for a, a farm kid, so to speak. I tell you about this now, go ahead and just jump ahead a little bit further. When we got our discharge, Robbie went back to Fenland Falls and I visited the family. Down there was a big family, about 10 kids in that family. But Robbie was still living in Fenland Falls and he got a job with General Motors. And as some, a lot of people did. And he had a ride uh, from Fenland Falls or uh, down to uh, Oshawa every day. Yeah. At that time, he would have been about 23 or 24 years old. And he was out canoeing on Pigeon Lake. No, you haven't guessed it. He didn't drown. He didn't even get in the water. But he dropped dead in the canoe. Oh he was a kid, 23 or 24 years old. He had no, no symptoms. And I went down to a funeral. That was a really sad thing. Well, you see here, this guy, he had probably saved my life. And here he was. He just, 
Finally, and he dropped that in the canoe. But those, anyway, if you're interested in advancing through the log book, you can see the different ones, and I have made some some cases here where uh, the number of aircraft on a certain target, and, and uh, I can remember most of these targets. And uh, if I, if uh, the raid was on, I, I could uh, uh, have made note here. Sometimes we get the report the next morning about how many aircraft returned. Now, in, a, in our squadron, there'd only be seven, seven, seven planes fly from, from 420 Squadron. On the same station, Talthorpe, which was about 10, 10 miles north of the city of York, the 425 Squadron, which was the, the French Canadian, the, uh, the Canadian right. Squadron. Yeah. Uh, at least uh, the, the, uh, it was made up of French ground crew anyway. Uh, but those, that'd be, four, that'd be 14 aircraft from one, one aerodrome. And in, uh, in Yorkshire, that was the Canadian bomber, that was number six bomber command, and they were RCAF crews. Mostly, there was the odd one from another crew. So there were some, a few Aussies there, and some, some Polish boys there, and the odd English. We had one English fellow in our crew who was the flight engineer, and uh, so I'm just, uh, just, to, just a moment. I got this thing straight in my mind here. But, but in any case, coming back to the log book once once again, I have made notes here of some places where we might have it might have been 900 aircraft on one target, and the might might have been uh, maybe a dozen or two dozen. For, uh, uh, planes that failed to return. That's what it wasn't. They didn't know that they had been killed or anything like that because there were a lot of fellows that were able to, to bail out, you see. But in any case, we, we had, you knew how many aircraft had been missing that night. Now, how did they line this thing up? Well, it came out of the, first of all, the, the uh, night that there was a, a bombing raid, the target was selected. And that morning, there'd be on the DSO, the daily DRO, daily routine orders would come up there, and the crews that were on that night were posted in two or three places, in the mess and, and different places. So you looked at that at 10 o'clock in the morning, and you'd see the name, always the pilot's name, Aldrin, on tonight. Okay, we're on, on tonight. And at that moment, of course, you didn't know that there was going to be fun. It all depends on the weather and that sort of thing, whether or not you ever did take off. But anyway, you knew by the 10 o'clock in the morning whether there was a raid on and you didn't know anything else. But the navigators met that afternoon at 4 o'clock. And all the navigators from that station would, would meet with the briefing officer to <coughs> outline the target, what target it was, what kind of a target it was, and what probably you would expect for air, uh, anti-aircraft uh, fire and that sort of thing. So the, the, the navigators would be there probably for an hour or two with him and then that night you'd have dinner and so forth. That night about 10 o'clock at night, depending on how far you're going in and that sort of thing, well, about 9 or 10 o'clock at night, still daylight, because we're in double daylight saving time and we're in the north of England. So it was quite, uh, quite uh, bright at that time. And the, the whole crew then would meet in a briefing room, or it would be twice as big as this and so forth, and you had the, the uh, meteorology person there, which meteorology was very, the weather was very important, but they were guessing a lot. They could, they could be fairly accurate about what it was going to be in, what it was going to be in England or on the North Sea, but once you got over the continent, 
you didn't know when you were guessing there. And of course, navigation is finding winds and uh, the, the direction and the, and the strength. If there was, if you knew that there was no wind, then all you do have to do is point your aircraft. But when you're when you're uh, navigating, the secret is is to find the wind and take that wind in your airspeed and so forth and calculate it as the best you could and give the pilot a, a course. And you, if you stood out here against a pole and saw a, a plane flying overhead, you might even see the plane going a little bit slightly, like, not, in, not a straight line. Because of the, they wanted to go there, but they have to uh, they have a different course to get to that point. So anyway, the whole air crew would be there, and you'd get this briefing, and the target, the, uh, the, um, the target would be told at that time to the rest of the crew. And after that, you may have another hour or so before takeoff time. And the fellows would be uh, convincing with one another at that time. And, and were we frightened? You're damn right we were. If you weren't, there was something wrong with you. But in any case, you'd say, well, what are you, they'd be planning what you're going to do tomorrow. Well, you're on ops tonight, you're not, you're not going to be on tomorrow night. So you go, well, we can what, we go to the city of York tomorrow night and see a show or whatever it is you see. And then somebody says, he, he thinks he's going to be here tomorrow night. Uh. But it's kind of, that was kind of like whistling past the graveyard. Yeah. You know, you just kind of make light of something that's very serious. And I told a story the other night when Bob, uh, Bob has heard this one. <clears throat> and I heard it from Fred Cook. A lot of you knew Fred Cook. And I shouldn't try to tell his stories because he was an expert. <laughs> but in any case, it had to do with Pat and Mike and they were uh, getting into the, into, the, uh, into the booze a little bit in the bar and they were getting higher and higher and higher all the time. And Pat said, well, I'm going to go home. And Mike said, oh, I'm not going to go for a while yet. So anyway, he said till the last dog was hung, and when he struck off home, he was walking home, and he had to walk down this street, uh, road here, you see, and <coughs> made a corner, uh, another, another walk down here, and it was pitch black, and <coughs> he got down to there, and there was a cemetery right on the corner. <coughs> so he said, well, I'll just cut through the cemetery tonight. I just cut across Crock Corner, you see. So anyway, he staggered down through the cemetery, and, and uh, there was an open grave, <laughs> and he fell into this grave, <laughs> and he started to climb out, you see. And he'd get up just about, and he'd fall back in, and he'd do it again, and he'd fall back in again. But Pat had done the same thing. He had walked out ahead of him and had fallen in exactly the same grave. He was at the other end of the grave. I'm watching Mike climb up the other end of the grave, you see? Finally, Pat said to him, you can't get out of here. But he did. Well, you can visualize Fred Cook, those of you who know. You can tell that story. I wish I could do the same. But anyway, that was the, the sort of thing that you kind of made light of a very sorry sort of thing. And, and uh, I, I guess it was the right thing that kept a lot of it going, that sort of thing. Uh, I have a, a bunch of, uh, this was amazing, I, had, I didn't even know that I had these things. But here are, the, here are the old, this is what the navigator did when he was uh, working, you see so that you can look through these things and they're not much to look at. I, I look at them now and I haven't got a clue what's going on. <laughs> I didn't then <mean> either. <laughs> but in any case, they, they do have the, uh, the, uh, a lot of figures and they meant something at the time. Because as you, the navigator, by the way, in, in, the, in, the, in the afternoon when he had the meeting, each navigator was giving his uh, 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 his altitude and time to be over the target. And you might be on for 
202 or something, whatever. You were given the minutes to be over the target. And uh, at your altitude, something between uh, the high, the night trips were always high, and they would be anywhere from 17,000 to 20,000 20, feet. And sometimes I'd be going along. The only instruments I had in front of me was an air an airspeed indicator. Yeah, okay, Bob. Thanks. An air an airspeed a speed indicator and a compass and an altimeter. So anyway, I'd be going along, and, and uh, I'd say to the pilots, "Look, I have to have another thousand feet." And he'd say, "I'm sorry, I can't get it any higher. You're with a bomb load." which is about 8,000 pounds. If you could either, when you got up to about 17,000 feet, the air got so thin that it wouldn't, it, you couldn't lift it anymore. And some, some, another aircraft might, but uh, that's the way it was. You did your best to try to reach the altitude, which might be in the levels of 200 feet or something like that. They didn't want all the aircraft going in on a complete level. So anyway, uh, uh, this sure isn't a very organized speech. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, oh yes, I was talking about uh, these uh, worksheets. The next morning, you see, the navigator, or the next day, the navigators all got together, and your sheet was handed out to someone else. And he then, and we all back plotted that from take, taking the time you actually were over the target and bombs had bombs away, then you back plot up back right back to where you were. So that you, there was no way that you could fool the, the, the officers back home that you were there. What's more, as soon as the bomb aimer touched his, his trigger to let the bomber start to release, then the cameras started to go. And they were all posted too, under the pilot's name. So that you couldn't come out over the North Sea and uh, say, "Well, I won't go to the target at all, and go back and drop your bomb bomb out over the North Sea." And the same thing I might be uh, point out as far as fighters, uh, as far as uh, gunners are concerned, and answer your to your question, you couldn't simply say, "Come back on a crusade." I shot a, fi a fighter down that night in a sudden. That was fine. They would accept that when they say where was it. The navigator would give them, well, as close as he could, the approximate latitude and longitude, and it was the posted. But the crews flying along, they could see other aircraft if they were being shot down. Whether it was a fighter or whether whether it was a, a bomber, it made a different size of a fire or whatever, you see. And they'd say in such and such a latitude or long. No, they wouldn't give the latitude long. They'd say in five miles on the port side, a fighter is going down. So the navigator, you had it over in your, in your, over in your earphones, and you were down then, and you give the latitude and longitude, and when you came back to the intelligence officer, you reported that we saw an aircraft going down in that particular area. And if that was confirmed enough, then the pilot, the, the, uh, the gunner got credit for that uh, bomber, or that uh, fighter being shot down. And of course, when you were being attacked, the, 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 usually from the rear, and the, usually the air, they, well, I think always, the, the tail gunner was giving the instructions to the pilot. If the fighter was coming in on a certain direction, you didn't want to go out on your port, port side, you wanted to, to go to the starboard side. And the, the fighter then, or the, 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 the gunner, and the answer to your question again, this is where a good gunner shows up, whether he's not panicking himself. And on his 13th trip, and you'll find it in my logbook here, he was awarded an immediate DFM. He was a sergeant, and a DFM was the same as a DFC. But he got it instantly from Bomber Command. During the course of the 34 trips, he got two. Our mid-upper gunner, that I mentioned before, who was about 35 years old, on his third trip, <coughs> he did get he did get credit for shooting down a, uh, a bomb or a, a fighter. But 
The third trip was the last he did. He just couldn't do it anymore. He went to the medical office on her and complained of stomach problems. Now, that's what he should do. If he can't stand it, he should do that. But the medical officer had no cure for that, what was wrong with him. All he could do was take him off of that crew, to the safety of the rest of the crew. And he would remove that person, whether it was a gunner or anybody else in the crew. I guess the, the, that was the end of his trip. And he, usually they, they were, for his own uh, feelings, he, that person was usually moved, removed from the squadron. Because he had to eat with the rest of the fellows and that sort of thing that who he had been flying with, you see. But in, in Max's case, they didn't. For some reason or other, he was there. And to his credit, you know, he did, he did mingle with us all the time, asked us where we were, how we got along, what happened. So we, uh, we, uh, we felt that that was good too. And at the, finally, after we were, had completed, we knew what we knew was our last trip, which was the Kiel, uh, Kiel Canal, Kiel City. And that was a hard, and, and the submarine base in there, you see, and it was always a hot top, a very hot topic. Uh, so anyway, <clears throat> we, we knew that was our last trip, and when we got, they, they said that, okay, you're screened. That means you're ta you, you've completed your 34 trips, and they take you off operations at that time, you see. Because they felt that a crew, if they've had a rough time, that's about all that they could stand until they have a holiday. So at that time, uh, we had a party, and we invited Mac McLeod to the party. And of course, the poor guy was very embarrassed, and he said, I wish I could have done a second. But none of us wanted to do it. But there was always that gut feeling. I had it, I think most of other people had. I was actually afraid of being afraid, if you can figure that out. You just, you did it, you, you, your training came to that point and you seemed to have it in your, well, I want to complete it. But you just hope that, that you did it safely. But at the time, I said to the crew, I said, well, I had no doubt that my pilot was not the best in the whole Royal Air Force, RCAF 2. <coughs> the same thing with my palm aimer, my gunners, my, fire, my, my uh, wireless operator. I had no doubt about your ability. As far as I was concerned, I trust my life when I did with you. They said, you know what? I was the weak guy. You weren't. <laughs> they had the same feeling about me, yeah. and that's the fortunate part about the whole thing. But I remember coming back one night, and my position in the Halifax—I flew in the Halifax most of the time. The odd time I did, I did a few trips with with Lancasters, but Halifax was better for a navigator than a Lancaster because of the position of the escape hatch. <laughs> which was right under my seat. <laughs> I wouldn't have taken a million dollars and jumping out of that plane, but if the pilot had ever said, get out, I was going to be the first guy out because I had to jump up and my seat would immediately flop up against the wall and I could reach down and grab the manhole and pull it up and drop it and it would be sucked into my hand anyway. You see? I'd have a note make sure that you put on your, uh, your, uh, air, your parachute before you jump. <laughs> but anyway, I was coming, we were coming across the North Sea one day and the, the, uh, the pilot sat up here and right underneath him was the, the wireless operator and then right in front of that was the navigator's position and out in, right in, right in front of the perspective was where the bomb aimer was. Now, I, I was busy all the time, from the time I left until I got back, and this is proof of it. They had a time to sit up and work, look around, you know. <clears throat> and if the pilot was a few degrees off, off course, I'd say, can't you keep the darn thing on course? 
but it didn't really matter because I was lost anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but coming across the North Sea, I remember, and you couldn't break silence. You know, all you had to have a, a leather helmet, and you had earphones in here, but your oxygen was hooked into your mouth, a piece here. You see. At 10,000 feet, you, the pilot would say, hook up your, your oxygen. So you immediately snapped it in. It was a quick cover, and it was on the wall. I just snapped it in place. But anyway, you you dare you could not break silence unless it was necessary. And the reason for that is that somebody might be joking and say, "What oh, did you see that over there?" Yeah. But at that very moment, the pilot had something very important to say. So therefore, you didn't break silence. So anyway. Merv, 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 my wireless operator, pulled back the curtain. He boom, moves his uh, mouthpiece off, and, in, and, and he mouthed the words to me, "Where are we?" <laughs> and I, he looked there. I put my finger on the map like that. You see, he's good. I hadn't a clue where I was. <laughs> But I was flying west, and eventually I'd get over England and be able to pick up some of the navigation aids there. I hoped. <laughs> uh, those are little things on the, on the side. So, there's another thing, that, another bit of humor. The last trip, the, the, new, the new pilots coming in, just the pilots, but the new pilots coming in always had one trip with another experienced crew before he took them, uh, the next night probably out with his own own crew. And this pilot was flying with us that night. I had forgotten all about him being in the airplane because I was down on the nerves of the plane. And I, over the intercom, you see, I uh, spoke to the uh, pilot, I'm going to order a order course in such and such a time. Two minutes or whatever, you see. And that gave the gunners then, and anybody else looking out, to, to make sure that as well as they could, look around, to see if there are any other aircraft in that particular spot. And uh, the, I think the pilot came back and he said, well, I see another aircraft out to the port side here now. Well, I said, it doesn't matter. He's lost too. <laughs> so the other pilot, I didn't know the green, the other pilot was there listening in on this thing. A few, few humorous things like that happened. And it kept, it kept you going. That's about the only thing I have to say. But I, I've been rambling on here. I'll just take one final look here to see if there's... <laughs> Uh, oh yes, I might, might say a word or two about uh, uh, when you came back from a, from a flying a bombing mission. You went to the briefing, debrief room, I guess they call it, and the intelligence officers there. Uh, there's usually two for uh, the, the, the each crew, and they would ask questions, and you would report what you would seen the best you could, and they made notes of. That's how they made up their stories. And the Padre was always there. And it was in a room similar to this. There were different tab tables over there so that one crew could sit around one table and they had two briefing officers, or two uh, 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 intelligent officers there taking the notes and so forth. My hearing was pretty bad at that moment because I, could, my, I just couldn't carry on a conversation. I knew what was going on, but I just couldn't carry on a conversation with him asking me questions. I was worse then than I am even now. <laughs> but I would then sometimes go and have an appointment later with, with, with the intelligence officer to give my side of the story. And he would look over my work and that sort of thing and get the, the message that way. But the pantry was always there, pouring coffee and so forth. But early in the earlier in the evening, when we were on the went out to the to the uh, the uh, dispersal sites where the aircraft were put were tied up, they weren't all tied up in a line at any aircraft in England, because they did they uh, they probably there'd be two, maybe five or six acres for one aircraft, and then another half a mile away there'd be another uh, dispersal site. And if you look at uh, look at these uh, maps here. 
there, there's one there of all the flights in, in uh, of the RCAF in Yorkshire. And there were, uh, in Yorkshire, there were nine active airfields on, on Bomber Command, and two were just training flights. But on these aircraft, you can see that the dispersal sites are out here. The black dots were, were there, and the aircraft were there. We were, were spotted like, like that, and the Padre, usually the uh, Protestant and the Catholic, were together, and they rode around in bicycles and had chocolate bars or gum and so forth, and, and would visit with you for a few minutes. And it would be usually a warm day or something like that. And they, uh, they, you couldn't divulge where you were going, that wasn't possible, and they knew that. But very often they, they would say to the navigator, what time will you be back? You see? Well, hopefully 4 a.m. or whatever, you see. They didn't know how far you're going to go in, if it was just across the channel, or not the channel, but across the, the, the North Sea or you know, something like that, and maybe back to the Ruhr, or you were back in four hours. The long trip, the longest trip I had was to Stuttgart, it was about eight hours, and the tension there was more than even the density, because you were just tightening all the time, and you were so glad to get back over your own air dome and, and, and land. And when you called, the pilot would call for turn to land, and the controller in the tower would say, turn seven. And you waited, and they kept letting him down, letting him down, letting him down. And very often, when the turn seven, when your turn came, you came in, and the pilot hadn't been down low enough, you see. He was probably up 10 or 20 feet in the air. But believe me, after being up there for seven or eight hours, you weren't going to take another chance to fly around there for another half an hour. He let the plane drop, and you bounced it in. So we used, to, we used to say, well, we had so many bounces that night. <laughs> uh, but oh yeah, so I was thinking about the Patrick. Yeah, one more question. Yeah. Was your plane ever close to being shot? Was your plane ever close to being shot? Every time. <laughs> but not by fighters, by anti-aircraft. And you couldn't do anything about anti-aircraft. Because the, it was set to, just like, like if you look at a, a, a firecrack show, a fire, a, you know, fire, fireworks, they go up there and they go up so high and then they break and they go pop, 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 pop. Well, that's exactly what happened in anti-aircraft. They shot this stuff up and 20,000 feet was about their limit. But they usually boxed it in for about 3,000 feet. And it was usually, they had by this time determined that the, 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 the course where you were coming in over the target. And that's when they opened up. So you are going in there. And when this flak, the shrapnel and everything else, broke, it was going through the sky just like raindrops. And of course the, the plane itself was nothing more than the size of it, not much thicker aluminum than a, a bit of paper. But you didn't know until you, the, the next morning you went to look at your plane and whether or not you'd been hit. But you even put some of the holes are only as big as your finger. But the odd time, and, uh, you'd have a hole maybe so big around if it was in close. And as long as you weren't in the line of fire when it went through your plane, it didn't, it didn't matter. And you couldn't do anything about that anyway. But the one thing that, that the big danger that you caught, might be able to do something about was fighters. Now you couldn't very often hit them because they were flying at about 500 miles an hour. We were lumbering along at about 200 miles an hour. But they had to aim their uh, aircraft at, the, the, at, the, at the, uh, the bomber. Whereas the bomber uh, the, the bomber fighters, or the bomber gunners, they had turrets and they could swing around. But they were always shooting like 22s compared to a cannon. And the way that the, the fighters got you, they would come up underneath you, you see, if they got a plane off to one side, they sometimes get, they get you in the searchlights, and that was a, that was pretty bad. But otherwise, they'd get underneath you, and they'd come up. Maybe they might be down a thousand feet or two thousand feet, 
but you're looking down against a black thing that you can't see down, down. You can see up if it's a clear sky. If there were a plane up here, you can see it sil silhouetted against the, the sky. The fighters could come up and, uh, and rip you through the bottom, and you were, lots of bombers were shot down, and they didn't even know what hit them because it came from underground. Now, if the aircraft was coming from back, uh, more or less on the side, and the gunners had spotted it, then the gunners kind of took over as far as controlling the aircraft was concerned. And then you tried to make a, a fighter, uh, uh, what they call a fighter affiliation. So that you tried to corkscrew or whatever you could. You couldn't do it on the full load. Well, if you're on their way back. And that's when most of the aircraft were shot down, by the way. Simply because the crew got careless. Yeah. By this time, you dropped your bomb load. And uh, you, you uh, were on the way home and you kind of, oh, well, it's all over you today. But you still had four, about four hours to fly over enemy territory. And they were still have blowing and wanted to shoot you down. Um, that's the question I should have asked. You were never seriously hurt. No, no, I wasn't. I am very fortunate. Uh, the, the worst uh, uh, accident, our flight engineer, our first back, right, he was standing. He usually stood up, the pilot, right beside the pilot. He was the kind of the assistant for the pilot to control all the, uh, in all the instruments on your instrument panel. And he was trained on all of this sort of thing. And uh, so he was the, the assistant to the, and he was standing there in the perspex. Uh, now what caused it, whether it was a direct hit or what, but it exploded in his face. And he got his face banged up. But he came back that night and uh, he, uh, I think he was in the hospital for a day or two, but no serious damage. No, we were, I was very fortunate. And uh, uh, it certainly wasn't skill, it was just a fortune. But you take Laurie Melbourne. Laurie was twice as good a student as I was at school. But on the other hand, that made no difference either if you got hit. So, but, but anyway, there was uh, some, I lost some very close friends. Another yeah. question. Now, what year did you go overseas? Uh, 48. 48. Yeah. And then when, what year did you come back? 44. So I, I was there just a very short time, David. And uh, but uh, I, I, when I came back, it was just for uh, a, uh, a two-month leave, and I was intended. Uh, they had, at least they told me that I would po be posted back to England, probably for another crew, for another operational tour. Uh, the one that you, uh, the people here would know, was Lou Neely from Guildford. Lou did two trips. He did one the same as I did on, on carrying a bomb load, and the second tour was on lengths, and that was at 30,000 feet. That was above the, the fighters and above the flak. But they, they, they could get over the target and circuit, and they had specialized, the best they had at the time, to pick up the target down on the, on the ground from some way from. Uh, I'm not just I can't explain it to you, but anyway, they would be there, and they were you could they were talking to the the bombers as they approached uh, the target, going over the target, and he, they you'd hear them come over. You're dropping the bomb short, you see, which was at a tendency. The the, the bomb aimer in the front there, although his his bomb sight, he was lying there watching it, bring and, and when, by the way, as soon as you were running up to the target, then the bomb aimer was in charge. He, the mild took his instructions from the army for that time. And he could down the, just a, a, I have never used one running like that, but he, they're just like crosshairs. Now, the, the, bomb, the bombs themselves, we carried 16 500s, uh, which was a, a, the, the most common uh, load for a Halifax bomber. Lancaster sometimes carried two, eight, 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 two, four thousand. And the odd time, the, the bomb, the, the, the uh, Lancasters that were the dam busters, they carried 8,000 pound bombs, you see. But that, the Lancaster bomb bay was built for that load. 
and the Halifax was built for the 16,000, or for the 16, 500s. In addition to that, she carried bundles of incendiaries. So that, now, as far as you might say, well, what about targets? How accurate at 20,000 feet? Well, unfortunately, not very accurate. But I suppose as well as they could under that, at that particular time in the 1940s. But when you, when the bomb aimer said bombs away, he didn't pull the trigger and all 16 bombs drop out because the plane was just a shot up in the air. <laughs> so it, it was set. It was on a, on a circle and it was started just around like a clock. Probably it might take 30 seconds to go around. But the one bomb was dropped there and then one here in the, in the, in the bomb bay, see? And then one over there and one here. So that it took you probably 10 or 15 seconds to unload all of your bombs. Now on the way back, the bomb aimer's duty was also to check the position. He, had, he, could, he could reach in on just a small hole above the hangar of where the bomb was hanging <coughs> to, to look in there. And if there happened to be a hang up, and they're up, they were not often, but occasionally, one had them released. Now the bombs, while they were in the aircraft, they could be hit with enemy fire, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't blow up. They were set to, the, the, when they let go, there was a little propeller on their nose of it. As soon as it started to fall, it started to spin. And that set it so that when it hit the ground, it would explode. So that when you were really safer with a bomb load than with an empty aircraft, because you had that bomb load under you, and the casings, I don't know, but I, my guess, they looked to me to be probably an inch thick of the casing, you see? And they'd be around, about that big around, and about so long. So. Uh, and did you have a... Uh uh, uh, fighter escort all the way to the target? I'm sorry, David, I have to get it. Yeah. Uh, Did you have a fighter escort to the target? Uh, that was the target. Yeah. The odd time when you were just on the daylight range only, we had fighter affiliation just across sometimes when you were trying to pick up a, a rail yard or a, 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 a gasoline a dump or what do you call them, or have a lot of gasoline tanks. And you would only, those trips were, were short, David. They were probably no more than three hours. You were across and back, and the fighters could go that far with you. Now, the Americans did have us. They did all their trips in the daytime, and they did mass bombing. They went in there with a lot of crews, and they had one navigator, and they, you controlled uh, maybe 30 aircraft, and they flew in the daytime. Very often, they were coming, going out in the morning when we were coming back, we'd see them going out. That was a little different. And they did have fighter affiliation, and a lot many more. Their, their crew was about uh, 14 people. We had about uh, nine, uh, seven, actually. What, did they have B-17s? Pardon? Did they have B-17s? Again? I'm sorry. Yeah. Did yes. they have B-17s? Yeah, I think they were B-17s, yeah. I, I just forget. That was another thing about the training of, of the, everybody in the Air Force. Fighter affiliation, air, aircraft affiliation, so that you knew what your enemy was flying as well as what you were flying. But that's 65 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Can you tell me where in Yorkshire you were? Where in Yorkshire? Well, if, if you come and look at this later on, maybe this will like, I don't know, no it doesn't. I did have a map here. Uh, no, I don't, but the, 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 the Talthorpe, T-H-O-L-O-R-P, was the station that I flew out of. And in that station, 420 and 425 squadrons were there. And we mingled together in the mass, not only that, we were, other than that, we were uh, separate. But uh, the, the aircraft, the, the squadron I would call the Snowy Hour Squadron, and the one theirs was the Alouette Squadron. And uh, most of the stations did have two 
uh, squadrons on it. But the, the Talthorpe was about 10 or 20 miles north of the city of York. York. And that was the south boundary. On the, the, the six group, the Canadian uh, squadrons, were all in Yorkshire. And it extended right up to the, uh, well, to Scotland. Now that made it another extra two hours flying yeah. when you were flying because most of our, our trips were east from London and that sort of thing. See? Now the targets, the hot targets, of course, were the Ruhr. And they were, the cities there were close together and they were very big industrial cities. But in, in relation to the, they say, can you see the, the, your target? Well, the day trips. We did because we'd come down about 10,000 feet. And on the day trips that I went on were usually rail yards or, or gasoline dumps. Um, but at night, now for instance, in, uh, I mentioned Stuttgart. Stuttgart is a city about the size of Hamilton, but it's just exactly the same type. It's an industrial uh, ironwork type of industry there. And the main factory there was ball bearings. Now our idea was to hit the ball bearing factory. <laughs> now that's a pretty small target from 20,000 feet. And that's likely nobody ever hit it unless it was by, by luck. <coughs> but uh, they, they got pretty cruel in those days, David. If they didn't hit the factory, they hit the worker's house. And he didn't go to work the next day. That was the, root, the, the sad part of these things. And immediately before D-Day, our targets are, were, were usually low flying, going in to knock out rail yards so that they couldn't move their trips around. The, the troops, I say, the German troops couldn't move around as he fast. Now on D-Day itself, we were, we were, there were no bombers flying that day and no fighters. That was the action was all what you see uh, seen many times on the on the ground, but a couple of days later, when we did go out to to uh, fly, we were coming in a very low, maybe at three thousand feet, and once again there were no fighters. They didn't. Shoot. There was a, a safe trip as far as we were concerned, but you came in. But we were trying to to knock out something immediately ahead of the American or the, well, the English or Canadian, we didn't know we where the Americans were, but where the English and the Canadians had, had gone in on D-Day, we were just on probably another 10 miles on the other side. But unfortunately, that also became a bit of a, a, a problem. Because once again, when you went in that low with a heavy bomb, and the aircraft ahead of you were dropping bombs and they were exploding. Believe me, the aircraft were just bouncing just as if you were in an old Ford car, Ford car driving over a uh, uh, frozen plowed field. They were just, just bouncing like this. So how could you control the, the, the target that much? And very often the bomb aimers got itchy and uh, press the button press the button too soon and some of our own troops were killed by our own aircraft. So that's the sad part about it. Now to overcome that, and after about two or two or three days, they put a switch on the navigator's on the navigator's table. And he couldn't do anything about it other than the, the the briefing ahead of time. They said, well from the shoreline to that rail line, it will take you 10 seconds. Now, if it alternates from that, then you immediately make an, 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 an alteration before you throw your switch, so that he couldn't possibly drop, us, drop them short. And make mind me, we drop them long then, you see. So, and the same thing happened when, when you're out of, out of city, out of a, out of a city. They usually come in from a different, you know, different diagonal. If, if this week we went in from the east, maybe the next night you come in from the west and this sort of thing. Not, not that fast. It wouldn't be that fast. Although some of the really hot targets, not in my, in my flying, but the Americans did as well, 
uh, with the existence of the RAF, that they it really tried to knock out a city to really break down the morale. When you say, well, gee, how can you do that? Yeah. Well, my only answer to that is that when I first got to England, the, one of the first cities I went to was right in the Midlands. Um, what's the beautiful uh, city right in the middle there with all the churches? Coventry? 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 You, you, you fight back. So nobody enjoyed it, but it, you took pride in doing a good job too. I'm sure I have one final word before. Oh, yeah. One more question. Are you going to take some time to write your memoirs? Are you going to take some time to write your memoirs? Oh, no. My time is almost up there. But... <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be 98 in, in 15 days. 20 days. you got to write fast. Maybe <laughs> Mary will do the writing. Yeah. Right now, though, David, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm on my third or fourth genealogy course. And I've uh, another two more lessons, uh, one tomorrow night and one a week from tomorrow night at uh, North York High Library. And the instructor we have, she is really uh, uh, outstanding. But I've had about three or four courses, and I've had uh, several courses on, on computers. I had a course this afternoon on computers, every, every Monday afternoon. And every Monday morning, I curled this morning, and then I went to the computer course this afternoon, and I came here tonight to talk to you again. So, but I'm not 98 yet. One thing further, when I was on Bomber Command in 420 Squad and flying there, the Padre was Charlie Murray. Charlie Murray was in the First War as an interimant. He was a Scotsman. And after the First War, in 1919, he came to Canada. And he became a minister. And when I, Orm and I were married, we moved into Leaside, and Leaside United Church was our church. And Charlie came there as the minister. And I had him as a minister for 16 years at Leaside United Church. He was also a Rotarian, Bob, and we sat together every Monday, and he would say, well, what did you think of the service yesterday? <laughs> and I said, well, Charlie, those, that's hymns, or those hymns you had. That, I know, no wonder people don't go to church, you think. <laughs> so anyway, he said, well, you have to learn some new hymns, Lord. I said, well, then find the guy that wrote it. He died a hundred years ago. <laughs> But anyway, I knew him so very, very well. First of all, as a, I respected him. He was, a, he was a group captain in the Air Force as a chaplain. But anyway, that's another little bit of memory that came up when I started to look at these things, David. I thought, gee, yeah, and the nice thing, oh, gee, Roy Schrader, he was next to my heart. I, we met him when I got landed at training in Malton. Came from, Frank came from, uh, uh, Peterborough, and we became very close, and uh, we played together as a team of bridge, and we didn't know anything about it, but anyway, he was killed on his very first trip. Oh, yeah. So that happened, some of them, we had two trips, and right through, uh, like Lou Neely, Lou Neely did, but on the other hand, Lou's second trip was no danger of being shot down. He, it could have been a failure of an aircraft, or a collision, or something like that, but he was on, on on uh, Pathfinders. So, anyway, I'll leave the, some of this stuff here, and if you're willing, you're welcome to look at it, and uh, if you have any, any interest at all, I'll uh, be happy to try to answer your questions.
Thank you very much.